Um, but for now, we need to move on to our next presentation, which is by uh, Dr. Kirsten Carter McKee, who's going to be speaking to us about managing imperial legacies. Kirsten is a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Edinburgh's School of Architecture and Landscape Architecture. She has spent much of her, life, her career focusing on dialogues around imperial urban landscapes and the management, interpretation and analysis of the built environment, particularly in Scotland. In 2019, she was awarded an RSE networking grant in collaboration with the Coalition for Racial Equality and Historic Environment Scotland, which aims to engage with the legacies of white supremacy within Scotland's built heritage and how this can be understood, discussed and managed in the future. You're very welcome, Kristen. Over to you. Thanks very much, Susan. Um, thanks to you all for inviting me along today and uh, thanks to all the speakers and the discussion so far. It's been incredibly interesting and enlightening. Um, as uh, Susan's already uh, highlighted, I'm here to talk about and hopefully give a bit of a plug for um, the Managing Imperial Legacies Network, which is a collaborative two-year platform uh, with uh, Historic Environment Scotland, the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights, and the University of Edinburgh, which is funded by the Royal Society of Edinburgh. Um, although Susan mentioned it was awarded in 2019, it was um, uh, intended to commence um, in um, March 2020 um, and uh, was designed to link communities, heritage professionals and academics together to build links and provide opportunities for roundtable discussions, um, conversations that link research and history, the historic environment management and community projects within the urban realm that focus on conversations around race and empire and how these can be engaged with alongside discourse on social and reparative justice. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, so uh, why is this necessary and what is it for? As we're aware today, there are already a number of conversations going on in Scotland that are highlighting the many links between sites in Scotland, the transatlantic slave economy and empire. Re research such as Glasgow's links with the transatlantic slave trade by Professor Simon Newman and Dr Stephen Mullen, Drs Carly Kehoe and Chris Dalglish's work on the historic links between the Highlands and the Caribbean, and as we've heard earlier, Lisa Williams of the Edinburgh Caribbean Association's detailed work in Edinburgh, um, along with my own work, uh, which links uh, large swathes of 19th century Edinburgh Newtown to Scots profiting off of Empire in India, as well as numerous others, have all added to the wider conversation on this topic. While activism by organisations and individuals such as CRER, uh, Professor Sir Jeff Palmer, Lisa Williams and recently um, Edinburgh University students have also focused conversations on historic sites in Scotland, which have not just engaged on a retelling of a broader history, but have striven to engage with the lasting impact of white supremacy and institutional racism and what that represents in the present day. So managing imperial legacies wants to facilitate conversations on what we do with narratives around race and empire within the built environment and how we engage with grassroots activism and emerging conversations on this. While this project out of time and financial necess necessity has focused on one facet of this through the lens of Scotland's links with the transatlantic slave economy, it aims to provide a process to engage with more inclusive approaches to our historic environment in order to begin the process of decolonizing our engagement and work within this more widely, which as we've already seen this morning, can extend to traveler communities as well as discussions around other histories that have traditionally been overlooked or marginalized. In particular, it focuses on how knowledge on Scotland's links within the transatlantic slave economy can transcend into decision-making and the protection, development and interpretation of our historic environment and how we begin to approach this from a measured and considered way that appropriately addresses the legacies of this history as well as the history itself. Can I have the next slide, please? So here are the four key questions that we're attempting to engage with during this network. We're therefore looking at the geographic range and architectural scope of the impact of the transatlantic slave economy on shaping Scotland's built environment, how widely the legacies of empire are known and engaged with in Scotland, how to better include discussions on the transatlantic slave economy and empire within conversations on our built environment, and in particular, how to ensure space and platforms for BME communities in Scotland to lead on these narratives, and where and how policies and management of the historic built environment can support and enhance the above, 
I'm also taking reference from organisations outside of Scotland who've already engaged with these questions in our own countries and the previous speakers examples are, are, are a key um, example of this. Um, I would firstly like to consider, however, the, the top two questions and why further collaboration is important between all who are focusing on the analysis, interpretation and management of the historic environment in Scotland. And to do this, I'd like to actually uh, briefly use an example outside of Scotland in Cape Town, South Africa. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, recent work uh, published by um, Dr Nick Shepherd um, in our house university and in student activism at the University of Cape Town, South Africa, discusses the removal of the Cecil Rhodes statue in front of the university campus as part of the Rhodes Must Fall movement, which was set up by grassroots level UCT student body. Shepherd, however, also points out that while Cecil Rhodes statue was removed as the most obvious materialisation of a more general, generalised coloniality, the broader landscape of the university and its relationship with other sites within the built environment within the Grootshire estate, such as Cecil Rhodes Memorial, which, which sits at some distance from the campus, yet is still visible to and from it, retain the legacies of Rhodes' colonial and racist policies within the urban realm, even after the success of the protest movement in dismantling the statue. In particular, the colonial neoclassical presence of the university campus and what it represents as a symbolism of colonial power needs to be acknowledged as a broader dialogue of a whole landscape of colonial perspective, rather than just individual elements situated within an urban space. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Uh, the point here is that, as in the Grootshire estate in Cape Town, the wider urban and rural landscapes of 18th and 19th century Scotland were also developed using the same aesthetic theories, both around the architectural form as a symbol of state and imperial power, and how the organisation of space informs our consciousness of our own identity and our societal values within the urban realm. We see this also highlighted in American examples by Professor Mabel Wilson at Columbia University, who defines the neoclassical buildings and streetscapes of Virginia and Washington DC as landscapes of white supremacy through the ideals in which they were created to support a narrative of white superiority over black enslaved people. The historic landscape all around us is therefore designed to make us think, feel and act within certain parameters, all of which were set up through specific political, cultural and structural ideology of white supremacy an ideology that was used to justify the atrocities of the transatlantic slave trade and the wider colonisation of the British Empire. So if we engage with the whole of Scotland's landscape within these parameters in our mind, our consciousness of how we can read Scotland's historic environment and its links to the transatlantic slave trade and empire become much wider than just specific individuals or buildings identified in history. Instead, it brings us to all of the processes that operated within the imperial economy. This idea then, for example, further builds on the excellent work done in 18th century Glasgow that has already been highlighted today and shows how the expansion of Glasgow to the south and west in the 19th century is also part of this. Um, Lisa uh, mentioned the UCL compensation database, and if you actually look at that um, in relation to this map you can see that the majority of benefactors uh, that received this compensation in Glasgow were living in the uh, the newly proposed developed sections of the city um, in the 19th century. Uh, this will like, also expand to the development of industries and infrastructure in Scotland such as investment in railways which has already been touched upon today and links between the advancement of empire and the development of ports to both protect the mainland and facilitate the shipment of goods to, co to the colonies. Um, as we can see here, um, 1807 proposals for the extension to docks at Leith and the role of industries such as spinning and weaving flax in Dundee, which was imported from the Baltic and then sent it to the Caribbean and the American colonies, um, a process which predated the antis and anticipated the jute industry in Dundee, um, obviously another imperial link. Um, these, these can all be uh, identified uh, or likely be identified with the presence of um, places such as Carolina Port on this early 19th century map of the city. All of these supported imperial, imperial advancement and economic growth and the use of the built environment to support and uphold the political reasoning of those in power. Alongside the urban realm, um, can I have the next slide please? 
um, more rural examples of the design landscapes and country seats of enslavers, such as Charles Gordon Kearness's house estate, um, with thanks to Dr. Catherine Middleton at Historic Environment Scotland for highlighting this particular site to me, as well as the wider evidence of whole communities being established through industries with links to empire, such as the linen industry at Cromarty in the Black Isle and the town of Inverary, whose economy was based around herring fishing in the late 18th century, um, an industry that we know was uh, directly linked to uh, the Caribbean. While work on understanding how we can fully recognise and engage with the broad range of landscapes and operative networks within Scotland's historic environment is still developing within the research being undertaken by those in the Managing Imperial Legacies Network. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? Um, conversations on how the uh, network can address the second half of its aims will also evolve through the remainder of this project and hopefully belong beyond. Uh, working with the Coalition for Racial Equality and Rights, and I should give a special uh, shout out to Zanja Yemen here, who was uh, particularly uh, influential in this project. Um, this has been the central linchpin to all of the practices we've engaged with, as these, as these have ensured that the approach to conversations on the interpretation and management of Scotland's historic environment retains um, a focus on anti-racist practice at its core, keeping in sight what the historic landscape represents in terms of the lasting impacts of imperialism and white supremacy in the present day. This is a particularly important part of the process of engaging with conversations on race in Scotland's built environment and must be practiced alongside any addition to the site's links to the transatlantic slave trade or empire within its historic environment record or wider discourse on its management or development in the present day. And next slide, please. In particular, a focus on creating a covert response to the approach to our work, as well as aiming to continue to find ways to decolonise the wider academy and the opportunities and processes for funding within this has helped us find opportunities um, and the impact of our proposed outputs and delay of the project start due to COVID-19. Um, these are listed here um, in the, uh, the impacts and uh, the proposals that we have already um, uh, sort of implemented. Um, can I go to the next slide, please? Um, however, the group are conscious that in order for this network to really have as broad an impact as possible, there is limited opportunity to engage with the wider community in inline processes. Um, not everyone has access to the internet or feels comfortable with engaging with online platforms, for example. Particularly in light of the huge cuts um, to funding to the arts, cultural heritage and the charitable sectors, um, it was felt that in order to further engage with these conversations, our approach to this project should also be scrutinised under the same parameters of social justice that we are trying to engage with in our approach to this work. And so funding for in-person events has been realigned and has now been put alongside additional funding recently obtained to provide a COVID response to expand the project, which will all be implemented in early 2021. And these are some of the projects, the, the, the money that's been earmarked for these projects. Um, so just finish it off with just saying that um, we're keen to expand this network and um, we would really uh, like people to get in touch with us um, either with um, uh, research that they're carrying out um, with uh, projects that they are looking to work on um, and so, 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 so please do contact us and um, hopefully we can expand our network further over the next 18 months. Thanks. Thank you very much, Kirsten. It sounds like a really interesting piece of work and how unfortunate that you've been interrupted like the rest of us by COVID. But I think for this kind of work in particular, it's really useful to do face-to-face -face communication. So I imagine that's a bit of a struggle at the moment. One of the things I found really interesting about what was a really dense presentation, and I love a dense presentation because it means I can go back to it and watch it again and learn a bit more, was um, this idea of uh, landscapes being designed to reinforce the ideas of white supremacy. Um, I think there's a real temptation when you're an architectural historian to look at buildings as little islands in of themselves and not look at the actual street form and, and uh, understand what that teaches us. And I think statues in particular maybe bring that forward a bit more, but I think that idea of looking at a, a map or a plan of an area and saying, actually, these are the ideas that formed it and these are the ones that are reinforcing racial prejudices is a very interesting and perhaps a little bit of a new idea for us all. So thank you very much. Just a reminder to everybody that uh, Kirsten and indeed Brent will be back for the question and answer session in a little while.